Greetings from Tokyo, my dear, dear friends. This is Daisuke, and I very, very much hope that this video finds you well and in very, very good spirits wherever you are in the world. And today, if you don't mind, I would very much like to continue on with our journey, our exploration, our discussions with respect to the recent releases made by the Criterion Collection during this year of 2021. And that brings us to that title, which has been released by Criterion at spy number 1090. This is the work from 1970, and the filmmaker is D.A. Pennybaker, and the name of the work is Original Cast Album Company. This is the 1970 documentary from the legendary filmmaker D.A. Penny Baker, and it is called Original Cast Album Company. Now, that title sets forth, in essence, what could be described as being the essential you know, subject matter of what this documentary film is. D.A. Penny Baker and his crew went into this particular recording studio in New York City, Columbia Records, uh, on 30th Street, according to D.A. Pennybaker and Jonathan Tunick, as part of the supplements of this Criterion release, and we'll get to those later. So D.A. Pennybaker and his crew went into this recording studio and in 1970, and specifically the first Sunday after the opening on Broadway in New York of this musical theater production called Company, which was based on the uh, writings of George Firth and also music and lyrics by Stephen Sondheim and uh, directed by uh, Harold Prince. And so this production opened on Broadway in New York and then the tradition was that the first Sunday after such opening would be the occasion where the original cast of that production would come together in a recording studio and record the songs that would be for the release of the cast album of the musical numbers of this musical company. So that is the subject matter or conceit, as it were, of this documentary. And on that basis, D.A. Pennybaker and his crew went into this recording studio on this particular day, on this particular occasion, and essentially recorded, filmed, and memorialized for all eternity and for everyone to see this process, this artistic endeavor of creating this musical album within the context of the recording studio. This is the essence of the documentary, Original Cast Album Company. Now, in that context, it is a magnificent, extraordinary documentary for a number of reasons. It is funny, it is very charming. We get to see the the recording producer side and the engineers working within the studio context trying to get everything just right. We see the members of the cast, we see the members of the theater production, the musical theater production, we see members of the orchestra, and we understand too that there is a limited amount of time due to certain circumstances involving the performers and also the orchestra, etc. So there's a limited amount of time. They have to get essentially everything done within this space of one day. And so with that come a lot of drama, entertainment, tension, suspense, uh, high stakes, uh, fireworks as well. And the, I, the glimpse into the creation of this particular album is also focusing in on the performers too. 
to see them trying to get it just right take after take after take after take and when i say performers i also mean too their performances alongside the members of the orchestra trying to get it just right the recording uh, producers and engineers trying to get it just right this is a fascinating glimpse into this high stakes uh, endeavor of artistic creation and my goodness it is so entertaining it's so tense it's funny it is so illuminating and enlightening to get a glimpse into the artistic process the way it's set forth within this documentary original cast album company so this is fantastic this is fantastic now, when we watch this documentary we are of course reminded quite directly about the musical company itself now we don't necessarily get any direct say discussion or maybe overview or synopsis as to the story or plot of the musical company itself and so uh, we don't this is a documentary that is not focusing say on the the history of the production of company leading up to the opening on Broadway and then also the the particular recording session that we have here but we do get a sense of it we do get a feeling of it of course because we see within the context of this documentary we see the the artists that are very much part of this production and also we see or we hear and we experience the uh, the artists and musicians singing the songs or making the performances or or uh, providing the takes for the music and trying to get it just right in terms of the musical numbers the songs that make up this particular musical company so in that way in that way the film does touch upon uh, the aspects that are very important to this musical it's not focusing on the musical itself per se but again on the act of the artistic uh, creation process of the recording studio sessions for the purpose of making the album the cast album company if one wants more information about the production itself the musical itself then uh, for instance, and a great place to go uh, as a starter or as a primer would be some of the supplements that are found in the Criterion release here of Company. And I'll get to those I'll get to those supplements. Excuse me, in the latter half of this video discussion. Uh, so, but uh, of course, at, though at the same time, when we are watching this documentary, we are reminded of the musical itself, and we get a feeling of what it's about and of course uh, people who watch this uh, documentary uh, many people will already know the story and songs and the plot of company uh, as they're watching it but uh, if you don't know the plot of company that's okay that's not essential for a viewing of this particular documentary by D.A. Pennybaker. It's one of the levels, but it's not the only level, I would suggest. Uh, but again, at the same time, we do focus in on the specific songs of company uh, that are being recorded. So, for instance, um, uh, some of the songs that we see featured uh, are, uh, for example, Being Alive, uh, Dean Jones performing that, or we have... Uh, the Little Things You Do Together, or uh, Barcelona, or uh, Another Hundred People, or uh, Getting Married Today, etc. And so we have uh, so many of the songs that are being featured because that's part of the recording process. And so, uh, uh, and we see when you hear perhaps glimpses of what the story is or you get a sense of what the story is or what the the musical company is about by listening to the lyrics and by seeing the way that the the performers and musicians uh, maybe act and behave as they are singing etc um, and uh, so we get a sense of it uh, but at the same time, it's not focusing directly on the production itself. So that's one thing to keep in mind. But with that said, too, the details that emerge in this context, I think, are 
amazing. And this is one of the great strengths of this D.A. Penny Baker work. So, for example, I mentioned some of the songs that are seen being performed or being recorded. Again, take after take after take. And we see, for instance, uh, early on uh, the, uh, the performers um, performing the song You Can Drive a Person Crazy. Uh, Susan Browning and Donna McKechnie and Pamela Myers and also the orchestra. And then we also see the, re the sound engineer and the recording producer, Thomas Shepard, in the booth. And then we see Stephen Sondheim on the floor between takes trying to work with the singers and the performers trying to get things just right and then doing another take and then making another improvement, doing another take, making another improvement. And then we get a sense of the repartee, the banter, and the, the relationships, the professional relationships. And we start to feel that on the one hand there is this, uh, this comic repartee, this nice charming uh, humor as well, and people seem to be happy. At the same time, there is a sense of the pressure and also the detail. And if thing, one little detail goes wrong, then that means for whatever reason, then things have to be done uh, once again. And so uh, we already get a sense here of the, the potential for, say, chaos, as well as the charming human moments that form this particular ensemble, say, uh, atmosphere. So that's clear in that uh, part of the, or that particular segment. And also we get glimpses into the, say, artistic process and the sheer, say, breadth of scope and talent and bravura and the amazing almost, uh, one can say, amazing uh, theatrical and musical acrobatics and the high, high level, the top level that these performers and musicians have to bring. They have to bring their A game all the time because this is the album that will last forever. And so we see how these, uh, these musicians are actually performing. There's one particular number which is called Getting Married Today. And we see Beth Howland, who we see a really fascinating close-up on her as she's singing this particular moment of that song. And it's very fast. For those who know the song, you know what I'm referring to. It is very fast. There's a particular moment where the lyrics or the, the, the words have to be sung so quickly. And also they have to be uh, enunciated and pronounced with clarity while still being sung at high velocity. And we see a close-up on Beth Howland's face as she's singing this, and we see her trying to uh, move her lips and mouth in a way that will make things clear as they're being captured and recorded. So this is another fascinating glimpse. It's not just the song itself, but also the, the details as to the artists and what they are trying to do in order to bring their very best to the table. The... Uh, this concept, too, is also seen in terms of, and D.A. Pennybaker and uh, company really captured this well when they get really close in, in terms of the, the drama and the emotional, uh, the, sort of the emotional stakes and investment that these artists are giving to these performances. I mean, it's, it's not like they're just in a booth and in front of a microphone and just singing. They are really, in a sense, they are giving a performance in the recording session right there. For example, there is a song, Being Alive, which is a very dramatic number in the theater, uh, the musical company. And this is Dean Jones, who, per, who played the character of Bobby at this original stage of the production. Um, and uh, there is also discussion about Dean Jones and his involvement in the original production uh, in some of the supplements, and I'll get to that. And so, uh, But for those who know, uh, Dean Jones left the production uh, somewhat early. And so, uh, but his performance uh, as part of this first, first Broadway production the original pr uh, production on Broadway is now captured for eternity in terms of this uh, this film, uh, this documentary film. And one moment in particular is where we see a close-up of him performing the song uh, "Being Alive," 
and it's a very dramatic number. He gives it his, his all as he, we get a sense about or we, he indicates. And so this is, uh, this is uh, a wonderful for in terms of posterity and also in terms of capturing that moment of true uh, investment of high levels of energy in order to create these works of art or these performances or these recordings that again have high stakes because they have to bring each of these performers and artists and musicians have to bring their A game on every single take otherwise it's going to get scrutinized it's going to become uh, the, the problem needs to be resolved and sorted out and then believe me there are those problems there, and there are those issues that arise, and my goodness, they are truly dramatic and truly entertaining and suspenseful as well. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't also mention that one of the most famous aspects of this documentary, it is really famous and it is so dramatic and very tense and suspenseful in fact, one of the famous aspects of this is the way in which D.A. Pennybaker is capturing this moment where the artists and musical and musicians and producers are trying to uh, capture or, or record the best take of this particular number from the musical, which is performed by Elaine Stritch, and it's called the ladies who lunch. So the ladies who lunch is a number that again is performed by Lane Stritch uh, in the musical. And here we have her on the recording floor in the studio with the orchestra members and the people in the recording booth and Steven Sondheim. And she's trying to get it right, but it's not happening for whatever reason, take after take after take, uh, it's not coming together. And so this film and uh, the, the documentary therefore focuses not just on, say, the artistic triumphs and successes and the, the jubilation and euphoria that comes with a, uh, a great take and the efforts that uh, come with such uh, takes as well. It also covers the the frustrations and also the the intimidations and the risks and the fear of failure and also the details that also lead to identification of issues with particular performances and particular takes of recording studio sessions etc and this is all in the context of as i say elaine stritch's trying to get it right here, trying to get it right take after take after take with regard to her recording of the song, The Ladies Who Lunch. This is so, so fascinating because, for example, we get, at one point, we get the camera going close up on her face again, and we see her trying to to give, in essence, a type of performance on the studio floor of the ladies who lunch or one take of the ladies who lunch and we see that happening and also uh, afterwards we see the reaction of people in the recording booth and we see for instance a somewhat morose down looking uh, 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 sense from uh, Stephen Sondheim, for example, it's just not quite there, and we also get the frustration, the uh, expressed so uh, uh, dramatic and volatile, and uh, so much full of life and energy from Elaine Stritch, and just it's just not there. And are they going to get it right? Are they going to be able to get that perfect take, or aren't they? Now that is the crux of the suspense, and that becomes, or that makes this film original cast album company not just a i mean it is a documentary film it is about the making of the of this particular album and it's covering the artistic uh, the human endeavor in terms of the act of creation the artistic act of creation and it's also a suspense film it is a drama a suspense drama will they or won't they will they be able to do it or won't they wow 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 uh, it is very absorbing, uh, highly engaging, so dramatic, 
incredibly entertaining. And uh, this is an example of that. This part gives so much of that uh, Elaine Stritch vigor and energy. Of course it does, right? Because she is focusing here, or she is the focus here. And we see the, the, the sort of genius behind her performance, uh, but also we see the, the real uh, energy and perhaps the frustration that is also uh, embedded within that as well. Again, in the context of this performance of the song, The Ladies Who Lunch. So again, uh, this is so absorbing and we will get more details, I should say, in terms of the, the this is a documentary that's behind the scenes, but in fact, in the Criterion Supplements, we will get behind the scenes about the behind the scenes. And so uh, there are some really interesting details that will emerge when one focuses or explores the supplement. So we'll talk about that momentarily. Uh, but this is an example, yet another example of the overall greatness, I would say, and the absorbing, highly entertaining nature of this documentary work, Original Cast Album Company. This is uh, the creation of art captured on film for the ages, for eternity. And it is done with such a sense of, of, of uh, sort of an intimacy and the camera just is able to get in there and uh, be almost invisible. I think the phrase is fly on the wall. Uh, but really, there is a sense of the camera just being there. And it's, uh, it's incredible to, to comprehend because these people, these performers and musicians are in the act or of the artistic creative process. And so it takes a lot of energy and concentration. And so for Dave Pennybaker and his crew to be able to go in there and be, uh, be able to be in the moment, but also be able to not intrude, but also, also capture those intimate moments at the same time, that is incredible. That is incredible, and that uh, is this is yet another example of this type of legendary filmmaking status. Uh, so, uh, a overall uh, a rich work filled with bravura and entertainment and high stakes and uh, uh, dramatic volatility and. Uh, entertainment galore and a look into the artistic process and for lovers of music and musical theater and people who know the company and the works of Stephen Sondheim and for people who know uh, these musicians and uh, actors and performers uh, this is a real treat this is an absolute treat for many for a wide range for virtually uh, anyone I would suggest and so uh, with that we have this uh, release of this film Again, the work, the documentary work from 1970 from D.A. Penny Baker. This is the documentary work, Original Cast Album Company. This is the criterion release of Original Cast Album Company at spine number 1090. It's purported to be based on a 4K digital transfer with uncompressed monaural sound for the soundtrack. It looks and sounds and feels really great. So uh, again, uh, Criterion has released this great presentation of this work. And as per usual with Criterion collection releases, they also have included a number of supplements that form, as I say, the behind the scenes of the behind the scenes. So this is another fascinating glimpse. And there is a lot here as well. So let us see what Criterion has included as far as the supplemental information and materials are concerned. So we have not one, but two commentary tracks. So the first commentary track is from 2001. And this is between or among, I should say, uh, D.A. Pennybaker and uh, uh, Harold Prince and also Elaine Stritch. So uh, Harold Prince or Hal Prince and Elaine Stritch and D.A. Pennybaker are here. I think they say they're in Elaine Stritch's kitchen. And in, in essence, it's D.A. Pennybaker speaking about the film, but he's also so gracious as he always is. And he's, uh, he's uh, interviewing uh, Harold Prince and Elaine Stritch there and giving them the opportunity to speak about the film and their uh, reminiscing about certain aspects of this particular 
musical company working with the other musicians and also the recording session itself and also working with D.A. Penny Baker during that particular time. So it is a multi-leveled, brilliant, brilliant commentary track. And again, we're getting the comments from these participants themselves. And so it is, it's, uh, it's great. So for instance, from D.A. Penny Baker, we get information about the the context of the recordings studio itself and the the uh, uh, the physical attributes of the studio what he had to work with he describes it as being almost like a trying to light a basketball game a basketball court and he had to rely on certain types of bulbs that were lighting the entire uh, studio complex room area and so he was worried because those bulbs, too, had a certain uh, limited lifespan in terms of hours that they would uh, be able to light and then they would essentially uh, fizzle out and die. And so he was uh, concerned that uh, he, he, too, had a limited amount of time to film because of the lighting, just as the musicians had a limited amount of time to record and uh, record the tracks, so too did D.A. Pennybaker have the limited amount of time, this time in terms of the lighting. So that's another level of the tension and suspense, uh, again, the behind the scenes in terms of the behind the scenes. Um, and also they speak, uh, Harold Prince and Elaine Stritch give their uh, comments in the background about the making of, leading up to the musical company itself. They mention George Firth uh, and they also mention the uh, Elaine Stritch and her, uh, her the circumstances that led to her being involved in this original uh, theater production. Um, also they speak about the work company itself. I think the phrase interestingly used is anti-linear and this leads to a, an indication as to the place that company the musical company has in the history of musical theater and how it was in many ways very groundbreaking. Uh, it was, of course, uh, uh, Stephen Sondheim work working with uh, uh, Harold Prince, working with uh, Tunick, Jonathan Tunick and others. Uh, but also it was in terms of the way in which the plot was presented or maybe uh, the plot or perhaps it wasn't it's described sometimes as plotless, but it's it has this uh, way in telling a story that's not necessarily a linear told story in a manner of speaking. And so in that way, too, it could be said to be a sort of groundbreaking work for uh, musical theater uh, Broadway. So uh, that phrase is very interestingly used. Um, also, they speak, uh, Harold Prince and Elaine Stritch, for example, because they were there on the floor, right? We see a, a moment where Harold uh, Prince is actually sitting uh, in uh, w uh, maybe one of the recording booths. Uh, and so we see him for a moment. Also, he's, we see him eating lunch as well and discussing certain matters with Stephen Sondheim, etc. And then uh, Elaine Stritch also, we, we, we hear from her and from him about how the filmmaking process of D.A. Penny Baker and how there was not a feeling of a film being made. And that goes into the incredible way that D.A. Penny Baker was able to capture things in the moment, but at the same time, be almost invisible and so not intrude upon what was going on in the process and yet at the same time being able to capture it so uh, uh, exquisitely the way he does and his uh, his uh, the crew that he's working with uh, Jim Desmond and Richard Leacock as well uh, in terms of the cinematography and D.A. Pennybaker as well so this is a, a great and he talks too about how we had to have different cameras and so uh, different people were stationed in different parts of the area because the recording booth was here, the recording floor was here, etc. And so people had to focus and also focusing in on little details of the, of the, of the discussions, but also not just the discussions, also the reactions to the discussions as they were being told. So it's almost like things were being... There's editing too, but almost to the cameras moving such that there's editing within the camera in a manner of speaking. So, uh, yeah, uh, this is <laughs> very exciting stuff. Then uh, uh, Harold Prince talks about his working relationship with Stephen Sondheim and uh, talking about how 
uh, working with Steve and uh, Stephen Sondheim and also uh, Stephen Sondheim's work with George Firth in terms of the original uh, writing that form the basis of the, the musical company and Harold Prince makes a really in intriguing point about how Stephen Sondheim did not want to disturb the rhythm of George's plays, George Firth's plays, that was his quote and so uh, this is uh, this is reminding us how the basis for a company was the the a certain number of one-act plays that were written by George Firth that had this type of psychological uh, approach to an examination of of relationships and it this formed the basis or some of these plays and we formed the basis of what became the the line the through line as it were of the work company because it's described on the one hand as being anti-linear or perhaps with a not traditional plot on the one hand but there's also a sense of it being a work about relationships about the interactions between human beings and marriage and also meeting people and also the idea of maybe settling down and the the psychological and emotional uh, consequences of such acts and s situations and states versus say not settling down and what are the psychological implications and emotional uh, the the emotional circumstances of such state, states and situations and how people relate to each other observe each other how people try to to uh, to meet each other and how they fail or succeed in that particular or those particular endeavors etc and so this is again the basis uh, and forms the the heart or essence of the writings upon which the musical was created and so the this is great to hear from uh, Harold Prince uh, and um, uh, it's uh, really uh, really adds I think uh, another layer uh, of uh, type of uh, uh, information uh, density uh, in terms of the production itself company and I think that is very illuminating and uh, very enlightening indeed uh, so uh, and also he talks about how uh, everyone was a perfectionist and this is very important too because it means that everyone is bringing their a-game or they want to bring their a-game and they want to please the, they want to please, say, Stephen Sondheim. They want to make it just right. But uh, if they don't, they have to do it again. And their efforts in trying to do it again and again, take after take after take, this is part of the, the charm and the soul of this film, as it were. So that's really great to, to uh, get a sense of. <clears throat> and then we get, uh, for instance, from Elaine Stritch, we get comments about her and her approach to musical theater in general and her approach to life in a manner of speaking. She speaks about the way in which she, she, uh, she relies on comedy as, f as part of maybe her personality and how that comes through and how that shines through. And there is a, a really uh, witty way uh, there is a sort of acerbic wittiness uh, that she has in terms of her, the way that she uh, speaks with people, but it's it's uh, done, of course, in a very affectionate, charming way. And Harold Prince and D. A. Pennybaker, uh, they they admire this and they really uh, they really value this as part of Lane Stritch and who she is. And uh, so this is a, a lovely part of the commentary. And then she, the discussion talks about. Other aspects of the production, Dean Jones, uh, of course, who plays Bobby, uh, and they talk about his feelings about being in New York and how that might have affected how he felt about the production overall. And then, of course, what happened afterwards and Larry Kurt. Um, and there is also an interesting detail about a particular song, which is called Barcelona. And uh, this is um, uh, the... Uh, song uh, Susan Browning and Dean Jones and this song uh, was mentioned in the context of this commentary because it, they talk about or Harold Prince talks about what the consequences were in terms of this particular sponsor for the musical in, in the airline industry so that's an interesting interesting detail uh, and then of course there is the discussion about ladies who lunch and that part of the the uh, that part of the work 
And D.A. Pennybaker uh, says something really fascinating here. Remember where we were saying before about how this was the moment where it wasn't clear whether Elaine Stritch would be able to pull off that perfect take or not. And everyone was getting frustrated. And even though she was obviously trying her best, it was still very difficult, at least from uh, from certain point of view anyway. And there's one moment where we see a close-up on her in front of the microphone singing and indeed performing The Ladies Who Lunch. And D.A. Pennybaker says at this moment something so fascinating, which is that he thought when he was on the floor as he was filming this, he thought that this was a great take. This was great. And he could get a sense of the performance and looks in the look in her face and in her eyes, etc. But that take also was something that, according to the producers or according to the Stephen Sondheim and other musicians, it just wasn't there. So that that type of almost divide in terms of perception of a particular take or interpretation of a particular take, D.A. Pennybaker thought it was really great, but maybe others at the time in the recording studio or the recording booth didn't feel the same way. So that is very interesting. And D.A. Pennybaker remarks about that, remarks about how it was interesting, how there is this difference in viewpoint at that particular moment. And that really is, I think, another indication of the the complex, the wonderfully complex layers that go into the active artistic creation and endeavor. So again, the behind the scenes of the behind the scenes as we get it here in this first commentary track is great. It's great. But that is not all because we do get another second commentary track. Wow, wow. This is from 2021 and this is from Stephen Sondheim. Stephen Sondheim is speaking about so many things here. He speaks, for instance, again, uh, the uh, George Firth is brought up in terms of the genesis and creation of company itself, about how he wrote these one-act plays, or as Stephen Sondheim says elsewhere, or here, I believe, playlets. And so uh, these were very short works, but again, they were setting forth a type of... Uh, engagement on a psychological and an emotional level perhaps of certain relationship dynamics and so this formed the basis or part of the basis or some of these plays formed the basis of what eventually became company uh, according to Stephen Sondheim it was there was 11 plays and maybe two uh, there were two uh, that were used and then the rest was built around those in order to create company according to Stephen Sondheim and uh, it was uh, the the conceit was although it wasn't necessarily a linear plot the conceit was the focus on couples the relationship dynamics and couples plus a third person uh, and that third person would be reacting or they would be reacting to that third person what his it would be Bobby right what his dynamic would be uh, uh, and then uh, Stephen Sondheim speaks uh, about Thomas Shepard, who is the the recording producer, and we see him a lot in the recording booth. Uh, and uh, also Stephen Sondheim talks about this, the dynamics about the fact that this was a recording, a cast album recording in the studio, which is of course different from performing it live on the stage. But of course, at this t time, the... Uh, the musical had already had a number of, of performances leading up to this first Sunday. And so on the one hand, this meant that the, uh, the performers and members of the cast were already into, they could understand what their, their characters were, what they needed to bring. And so they were already used to that. So that, that's why they were bringing that. And they were still in, in some ways perhaps fresh. It was still somewhat new into or still uh, somewhat uh, early uh, in the uh, uh, from the opening as it were so there's a freshness but also there's a sense of already being a type of veteran in terms of knowing what the characters were and knowing what the performances needed so on the one hand but also there were certain dynamics that needed to be changed or adapted for purposes of the studio recording and he talks here Stephen Sondheim talks about how this needed to according to his phrase they needed to beef up certain aspects of the orchestra uh, so in terms of, of having a uh, the size of the orchestra be uh, appropriate for the recording studio session process. So, and in particular, the string section, according to Stephen Sondheim. So this is, uh, and he speaks about Harold Hastings, the musical director. And so, and as each 
performance or as each number appears and it, we see it performed, he gives some comments about that. So again, you could drive a person crazy or getting married today or a, another hundred people, uh, the little things, uh, uh, the little things you do together. It's, um, um, before I go on, I should say too, uh, when he gets, for example, to the song Another Hundred People, which is uh, considered a type of classic uh, in uh, musical theater and also in company. And this is Pamela Myers' performance. He gives a lovely anecdote about Pamela Myers and working with her and how the song almost wasn't going to be included and how uh, she describes how Pamela Myers, who was uh, uh, essentially right, just at that time, just starting out in her career uh, in musical theater, and she, according to Stephen Sondheim, she took the news really well, like a professional. And so that inspired him to want to really work to try to integrate the song to keep it. And it stayed and it became such a classic the way it is. And it's a beautiful song. And we'll get more discussion about that when you talk about the orchestration later in the supplements discussion. But um, and then uh, we talk, uh, there's discussion from Stephen Sondheim about Dean Jones and information about the role of Bobby and, and uh, the actor Anthony Perkins. Uh, and also there's uh, other numbers being uh, performed as well. And Stephen Sondheim makes comments about those being alive. It's sort of side by side, Barcelona. Uh, he speaks to you about, uh, again, this work company in the context of musical theater history. Uh, he describes it as being type of a kind of predecessor to another work, which is called A Chorus Line. Uh, and then uh, he talks about working with D.A. Pennybaker, that there was no real set planning, pre-planning in terms of what D.A. Pennybaker would do. It was just, in, in many ways, a type of almost uh, on-the-spot a spontaneity on the part of D.A. Pennybaker and what he and his crew are doing and then what Stephen Sondheim and his side of the equation were doing. So uh, incredible. And then we talk uh, once again about the ladies who lunch section, Elaine Stritch. And here Stephen Sondheim gives his take again uh, many years after the fact, of course, because this is 2021 uh, commentary. But he talks about how uh, this was likely a type of stage fright on the part of Lane Stritch in performing or in trying to record the cast album. So um, very much like stage fright on the stage, this time stage fright in the recording session or the recording booth. And uh, he does speak about uh, what has been uh, what has been mentioned, I think, uh, very much elsewhere too, about how uh, Lane Stritch uh, would. Uh, tend to have a little uh, drink uh, on the side, as it were, to get warmed up, as it were. And uh, I think Stephen Sondheim, he is, uh, he's, he, he says here about how uh, he, he, it wasn't that Elaine Stritch was drunk, but it was that when, uh, according to Stephen Sondheim, when people or when um, singers or performers or musicians, when they take a little drink of alcohol, it's not that the issue that is that they're getting drunk, but rather the, and again, this is in the context of Elaine Stritch and what was happening to her at that particular night. This is what the recording session was almost over and this was the last thing, uh, right? And so, but things were getting very heated and very tense. And so she, uh, when she performed, she tended to, uh, again, this is according to Stephen Sondheim and uh, others, uh, she would have a little sip, as it were. And it wasn't to the extent that she would get drunk, according to Stephen Sondheim, but it was that it meant that maybe she was beginning to lose control of her voice. Now, this is a very uh, interesting way that Stephen Sondheim puts it, to control one's voice. It's not just that the artist needs to have this powerful artistic voice, but the artist also needs to be able to control it. This is, I think, another glimpse into the artistic process that makes this film so fascinating and thus this commentary track so fascinating. And so then what uh, Stephen Sondheim describes is what happened, what is the climax, and, and what, they, what ended up happening as far as the, the way in which these issues may or may not have been resolved. And so uh, 
great. This is so great. We get not just one, but two commentary tracks. Again, the first from uh, 2001 and now from 2021. Uh, wonderful, wonderful stuff. So please check out the film. The film is not it's not quite an hour so it's just shy of one hour so uh, you can watch it and then maybe watch it again with one commentary track and watch it again with another commentary track and it's gonna be such a fun time uh, it's so fun so please check out the film with these commentary tracks if you can but now we go into the supplement section of the disc itself and there are a number of interesting ones so first is a discussion uh, or a, a wonderful discussion among Stephen Sondheim and Jonathan Tunick and Frank Rich. And this is from 2020. Uh, it's called Side by Side. It's approximately 29 minutes. And Jonathan Tunick is, uh, he is uh, responsible for the orchestration of company. And so we have him and his uh, relationship with uh, professional relationship with Stephen Sondheim, which is part of this conversation, and Frank, which uh, uh, discusses with them, asks them questions about their background leading up to how they were able to collaborate and work with each other uh, on this particular occasion and others, and also talking a bit about the background, about the nature of the original th the theater production itself, about the the performance in Boston, and also uh, the show on Broadway, Michael Bennett, and also uh, Harold Prince, or Hal Prince, and George Firth, uh, and the fact that the play, or the plays of George Firth, or the playlets, as it were, um, and uh, there's some interesting aspects about the nature, the sort of anti-linear nature of the plot, but at the same time, uh, there's a, a wonderful comment that's made here. It says that uh, one doesn't need a lot of context to understand the numbers. And I think that's really uh, so astute and so profound because it, it's, it's about the essence that's being captured in the moment uh, rather than necessarily having the need for a plot that goes from A to B to C. You know? So that is a really fascinating approach in philosophy, which I think forms the backbone for the reason why a uh, company is considered to be the groundbreaking work that it is. And so, and then next we get uh, Jonathan Tunick's uh, discussion as to what orchestration is. Uh, and this is fascinating. What uh, they say, uh, it's not just about the music, they say, but uh, it's, it's sort of like a theater orchestrator, according to Tunick, lighting for the ears. And so he talks also about how sometimes the orchestration has to do with the ambiance or the environment or the lighting as well as the music and so it's to create this overall environment or atmosphere or ensemble this is the role of the orchestrator according to jonathan tunick my goodness wow 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 what a beautiful way of describing it uh, and, so, and then they talk about uh, stephen sondheim's uh, and jonathan tunick's relationship how they create so Stephen Sondheim would be on the piano, right? he writes for the piano, and then Jonathan Tunick would listen to it and then absorb it and then try to get the orchestration, the music choice, the instrument choice for each particular number. Uh, and they take as a great, great example that song, uh, Another Hundred People. And so uh, the orchestration on that is beautiful. It's famous. And so uh, if you have a chance to listen to the, the, uh, the cast album recording, please do so it, uh, for all the numbers, of course, but uh, for that number as an example uh, in terms of the beautiful nature of the song, the lyric, and also the orchestration. Um, and they make a comment about Elaine Stritch and the film. There's a really interesting detail about how this film is about uh, or this film is being made with D.A. Pennybaker as a type of invisible presence, as it were. But at the same time, there are moments, and they were uh, comment on this, about how Elaine Stritch is, is seen on camera actually looking back. And so it's almost like she is aware of the camera being there. That is such an interesting detail that they bring up. Uh, and they speak more about uh, the, the, the nature of the live performance versus the cast recordings. Uh, and working with people like uh, 
uh, they say um, uh, Thomas Shepard and others, uh, and they talk about um, Dean Jones and Larry Kurt and also Anthony Perkins and also more about Elaine Stritch. And they say, uh, just talking with her, she loved to snap and, pe- and she loved to have people snap back. And so that's the type of, of almost acerbic, witty, uh, witty uh, charm uh, that she had in terms of her engagement and relationship with us. And people loved her for that. So, uh, and then they speak a bit about the, uh, some of the performances that were there, uh, being alive, etc., uh, and uh, also they talk about their reaction to the film, uh, the D.A. Penny Baker film. So a beautiful uh, and, again, another enlightening conversation uh, between and among these gentlemen. Again, uh, Jonathan Tunick and Stephen Sondheim and Frank Rich uh, here speaking, uh, approximately 29 minutes. But that's not all, uh, because we also get another conversation with Jonathan Tunick uh, from 2021 this time. And this is a one-on-one conversation with Ted Chapin, approximately 18 minutes. This is on the art of orchestrating. And this is a, a great glimpse into the the uh, incredible career of Jonathan Tunick, his, his illustrious career uh, spanning 51 years uh, orchestrating for Broadway. And then his work, uh, also including his work with Stephen Sondheim, his work on Company. And uh, Ted Chapin asks some really, uh, really great questions about what Jonathan Tunick's uh, uh, definition of orchestra is, the idea of the representation of uh, musical instrumentation, and how his job is essentially the arrangement and the creation of the the ensemble or the environment, again, the orchestration, and also how the music is very important in order to uh, what he calls about the, disc- the carrying of light motifs and uh, the light motif of various characters that carry through uh, the the uh, the theater. I'm sorry, the the musical itself. And then there's more mention of the the great number, an, another hundred people. Uh, a master class of orchestration as it's described here in this conversation, which is a great way to describe it. Uh, and he speaks to, uh, Tunic does, a bit about how he likes to work. Uh, for instance, uh, he, he, likes, he says how he likes to hear the composer sing the song or sing the number as it's being shown to uh, Jonathan Tuning. And this is to give him a sense of where he should put the points of emphasis because the composer uh, will naturally know where to put those beats. And so that's why Jonathan Tuning wants to listen to that particular singing done by the composer. Uh, So that's a, a really fascinating detail in terms, again, of the artistic process. And also he talks about how when he receives instruction, he, he, prefer, he can act or he's able to act. It's not like he says, if someone says to him, oh, I want f- like four oboes here. R- rather, he responds more to saying, um, I want, there should be a feeling of loss here or something like that. So he responds in terms of, of, uh, of uh, instructions that have a sense of the emotional uh, the the motive in the emotional rather than a kind of instrumentation technical basis, which is another interesting uh, insight into his artistic process. And there's mentioning of the the RMI uh, Roxichord, uh, the electric piano or the the electric sounding keyboard that's also used uh, to great effect uh, in many a song uh, in company. And uh, talking about the orchestration for the cast album recording uh, and the way in which the negotiating works. Because as we were mentioning earlier, the orchestration for the actual live performances is not always the same as the orchestration that is, or the orchestra that is uh, relied upon for the recording in the studio. And so there is, according to Jonathan Tunick, a type of, of negotiating that takes place in terms of which musicians will be used here, there. So this is another fascinating aspect in the artistic process uh, that he mentions and then uh, getting into details of the, uh, the the circumstances of the particular recording itself uh, 
he mentions uh, Tom Shepard, Fred Plout, and also Col Columbia uh, Record Studio on 30th Street. He mentions it being a four-track stereo and how that was amplified or adapted. And also he mentions how they both mention how uh, Jonathan Tunick and Ted Chapin are actually in the film itself. So they get uh, very brief glimpses, almost like cameos, as it were, but they're there. And so you can catch them uh, when you watch this particular conversation. And there's also a really interesting detail, too, about how there are also some faults as well, uh, according to Jonathan Tunick and Ted Chapin, anyway, about how there was one mic that wasn't, wasn't on and the guitar mic was off. So that is an interesting, very interesting detail as far as uh, the fact that maybe there were some, uh, right, th there are things that uh, are very difficult to catch, as it were. So again, the, the situation involved in terms of the actual recording process is revealed here. Uh, and also they talk about how the, these people were professionals, and how there was a particular moment where, uh, again, in the, the Elaine Stritch, uh, the ladies who lunch part, there's a moment where there was a real crisis, as it were, in terms of what can the, what can be done. Uh, we should bring it down a half tone, uh, which is part of the conversation. And this leads Ted Chapin and Jonathan Tunney to talk about how, even if the people in the orchestra heard that on the moment, they would have been they would have done that. They were able to do that immediately. If someone said, bring it down a half tone, they could do it immediately. And so this goes towards the professionalism and the high level, top level uh, uh, artistic, uh, the artistry of these particular musicians. So another great, great, great conversation. Uh, please check it out if you can. Next, we have the episode of Documentary Now. Uh, which is approximately 24 minutes. And this is a type of, of homage slash parody slash uh, type of uh, uh, look back on original cast album company. But it's done in this, in this uh, loving comedic way. And so we have the full episode, the, the 24 minute or so episode. And it's a type, as I say, it's an it's a parody slash homage, and it is so funny. So if you watch the documentary and then you watch this, oh my goodness, the the jokes are so spot on, the performances are so spot on, uh, and uh, the 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 humor. There's oh, it's it's everywhere. It's ever present. Uh, and it's they get it just right, and so uh, a, a co-op, right? Not company, but co-op, and that's the conceit for this particular documentary now episode. Uh, and there's some great. You should tip your doorman. Uh, cooperate with me, e, and um, oh man, here comes Anne. <laughs> I gotta go. Uh, way in which tennis is integrated into some of the songs the idea of uh, how to pronounce the word ruined or ruined uh, how it's related to the word harpooned and things of this nature it's great it's, and it's all based on stuff that we see in the original documentary the 1970 documentary so this is great this documentary now episode is from 2019 the original cast album I'm sorry original cast album co-op uh, 24 minutes. It is gold, uh, really gold. So please check this out if you can, or if you haven't already. And then that's not all, because then we get another supplement, which is the conversation among the uh, uh, participants of this documentary now episode. And so this is uh, Alex Buono, the director, and then also John uh, Mullaney, who is uh, a, an actor and also writer, co-writer, and Richard Kine, Paula Pell, uh, Renee Elise Goldberry, uh, Alex Brightman, and Eli Bolin. Uh, and uh, they are talking on this Zoom conversation. Uh, they're talking, they're coming together. Some of them, they're seeing each other uh, for the first time in, in a number of uh, right uh, for the first time in a long time and so it's a kind of a reunion of sorts and then they are talking and reminiscing about their time working on the documentary now uh, episode and uh, and this is approximately 33 minutes excuse me from 2020 and this uh, was this has a criterion channel logo opening it 
So they talk, they're talking about their reaction to the film. There's a really funny observation about how they see lots of casual smoking. Again, this is a 1970 documentary. And so there's a moment where it's uh, uh, one of the early numbers that's being uh, recorded and one of the performers is actually singing at the mic with a cigarette in hand and that was a detail that they absolutely loved. It was part of the times and it was something that they tried to capture as well. Uh, and um, they also recall too about when they told D.A. Pennybaker that they were going to make this, what they said that D.A. Pennybaker said to them was that he wanted them to give Elaine Stritch uh, like, please give her the proper respect. And so this is a really interesting detail. Again, it shows uh, the just how much D. Penny Baker cared about uh, Elaine Stritch in this particular part of the film. And so uh, th- that's an, a really fascinating detail that emerges. There's some discussion, too, about Hamilton and about performance and, and theater production in general and recording session and how this is very much like what it's really like to have a recording session. There's also an interesting detail that emerges as well, and this is something I think Richard Kind brings up about how there are or there were rumors, I, I suspect, about how perhaps in terms of the whole thing about the ladies who lunch and Elaine Stritch, perhaps there was there are the rumors that maybe Elaine Stritch was really, she kind of knew what she was doing. Again, we don't know if this is the case. And again, this is acknowledged here as rumor. So, uh, but they do talk about that, about how this may, this, there's a rumor that maybe this was, uh, this was uh, a little bit uh, for show for the, 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 the cameras of D.A. Pennybaker and company in order to make drama. Again, nothing has been found or nothing has been, been shown. And indeed, we don't get any sense of that in terms of any of the other supplements, including, I might say, that 2001 commentary track. Nothing of the sort is mentioned in there or the Stephen Sondheim discussion from 2021 or anything. This is just a, a remark that Richard Kind makes in terms of something that he says were rumors that were that were said. But it's again, um, I'm not sure how widespread they are, but it does add to the further deepening of the fascination of this very famous, perhaps the most famous component of this of this work uh, original cast album company so uh, another interesting uh, uh, wrinkle of a detail uh, and uh, talking too about performance and there's a really uh, great anecdote about the uh, an IFC theater showing of the work and how uh, the uh, recording producer Thomas Shepard uh, got up in the audience and he was there and he apologized uh, for what he perceived to be the film, the D.A. Pennybaker film, uh, capturing something of a type of, maybe from his eyes, it might have been seen from his vantage point to be a type of antagonistic relationship that he might have had between himself in the recording booth and then the singers and the performers who were on the recording studio floor. And so maybe he felt at the time that that was against what his philosophy was, was really working closely and intimately and protecting uh, the artists that were a part of the recording session. So um, uh, again, it's another really fascinating detail as to not just the artistic process, but also the look back and how powerful a documentary like this is and also how powerful and, uh, and needed and wonderful uh, homages like documentary now can be. Uh, and then also there's discussions here about uh, the the creation of the songs for the documentary now, uh, the numbers for the documentary now, uh, homage. And then also uh, John Mulaney talks about Stephen Sondheim, a really, really great way to end this conversation about uh, Stephen Sondheim and his reaction, kind of, perhaps, to this particular episode, which is great. So please check it out. It's, I think, at the tail end of the, this particular conversation. And there's great warm anecdotes about Richard Kind, dinner stories, having dinner with Richard Kind that some of the people there share. Great, great stuff. So uh, it is a fantastic uh, supplement. Again, a great supplement to the Documentary Now supplement, which is also a great supplement to 
the documentary original cast album company. So it all comes full circle in a manner of speaking. And I should say too that this conversation between and among the documentary now participants is also showing how much they love and respect and have seen original cast album company. They know this work so much. And so it all comes full circle in this wonderful set of of supplements. And that's not all because we also get uh, a section of the supplements which is described as being additional commentary excerpts and what this is is a this is focusing in if you recall on that commentary track which is described as being from 2000 among Harold Prince and Elaine Stritch and D.A. Pennybaker and so what this is is additional stuff that was part of that say say recording session of the commentary uh, but that wasn't part of that commentary track. So there are some extensions or excerpts or additional parts, uh, additional uh, extensions uh, that were part of that conversation. So we're getting a little bit more stuff, uh, uh, which is uh, wonderful. This is overall 11 minutes. And so uh, they talk uh, about in some detail, for instance, about the camera work. Uh, Jim Desmond is mentioned, uh, and also they talk about, uh, Elaine Stritch speaks about the importance of this role, how she needed it, uh, and also uh, Harold Prince speaks about the role of the story and re-examining the story, and there's a, an anecdote about the the use of the song Happy Birthday and how the, the circumstances around the use or inability to use such song uh, ne meant that they needed to create some new artistic ways around that, etc. Uh, and talking about uh, the character of Bobby, uh, talking about Michael Bennett. Uh, Chris Hedges is uh, heard as well, and she is also part of the discussion here, um, and which is uh, really lovely as well and uh, D.A. Pennybaker is speaking about how the capturing the reactions of people as they are part of the conversations this is also very important he also talks about the titles the opening titles and also the closing titles as well so what the circumstances were around his choice of titles because that is an interesting detail as well and then there's talk to I think in particular uh, between uh, D.A. Pennybaker and Chris Hedges this about the ownership rights of the film, uh, original cast album company. What was what were the circumstances around not being able to to get uh, the rights uh, to show it to, to make it more available uh, until uh, until more recently, of course. But that's after the fact. Uh, but still, uh, they do talk about the ownership rights, um, and also they talk about it as as it was ty a type of underground film. Uh, for theater people, uh, and it became it, its legend grew in that way, and it was shown at Lincoln Center. And D. A. Pennybaker has this wonderful reaction to the the particular venue that it was shown there. I think it was shown in the the library uh, part uh, instead of the theater part. Uh, but also, he talks about uh, hearing Francois Truffaut's reaction to the film, etc. So, oh, this is so great! Another great extension. Uh, to that earlier commentary track. So uh, please check it out if you can. This is described as being from 2000. And so I'm assuming, therefore, that the interview discussion among these three uh, took place in 2000 and then was assembled for the track, which then was made in 2001. So that probably is what's happening. In any event, it is part of that same discussion, I think, or I understand it to be. And this is overall approximately 11 minutes. This is another wonderful these are this is gold so please again check it out if you can and uh, I say too that we have the insert here now it is a fold-out insert which is again I'm not the biggest fan of I would have preferred the staple booklet type but that is okay uh, we have again the great design uh, that is carried through from the uh, from the uh, from the cover here and then we have the wonderful essay by Mark Harris which is called the little things you do together it's a reference to a particular number of the of the musical this is great it adds more detail and more levels uh, in terms of say a description of the 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 work the musical company itself again for anyone who is watching this 
maybe and hasn't seen company, reading the Mark Harris essay will be very helpful because it has details into uh, the the production history leading up to company. And it does uh, go into some discussion as to the, the work itself or the musical itself. And then it talks about uh, these great details about the recording session, this marathon session, as it were. Uh, and so uh, how people bring their A game. Uh, the performers are game. Are they game, as he says in one of the parts of the essay. So great. So great. Another great, great essay. Please check it out if you can. Ideally, maybe after you've seen the film, you can check out the essay. Once again, it is from Mark Harris, The Little Things You Do Together. And so, my friends, this is the Criterion release of Original Cast Album Company. Wow, wow, this is uh, fantastic. I should say also personally that I wouldn't necessarily consider myself to be any type of expert when it comes to, say, musical theater or the history of musical theater. However, uh, from uh, the vantage point from a a person like me, with very little uh, understanding or expertise in that particular uh, uh, f- uh, form of art, I found this to be so enlightening and engaging and entertaining, and the Criterion supplements went, uh, just gave me so much context and so much learning and so much uh, a scope of of uh, of uh, a type of uh, building blocks, as it were, for even more learning. And then uh, it's uh, what a great release! I think perhaps. Perhaps if I had to say one thing, it might be that it w- if it, w- it wow, could you imagine if this had been released maybe in two discs? One disc would have been the Blu-ray itself, and the second disc would have been the CD of the original cast album uh, recording itself. Wouldn't that have been great as a type of of, of uh, overall package? Wow, one can, uh, again, it's, I think, a very minor point, and you can access, you can get the original cast album through other means, and it is available. So please, if you uh, are interested, also listen to that album. It is great. It is really, really great. And you listen to that, and you watch this film, and you see the performance, or I say performances, but it actually is performance in the recording studio. These people, these artists are giving it their all every single time. And you hear the final product when you get the the, uh, cast album recording. It's great. It is great. So uh, please check it out if you can, or please listen to that album as well. And then please watch this uh, film, Original Cast Album Company, as released by the Criterion Collection. Okay, my friends, so that's it for now. And so until we meet again, please be happy and healthy and well. And please keep on watching a lot of great, great movies. Thank you so much, as always, for your time. I very, very much appreciate it. Stay strong, stay safe, and cheers.